In the previous episode, we studied various cap and stem mushrooms which live primarily on the ground, looking at how to identify various skilled species, as well as the pored fungi of the Bolitaceae family, which includes Bolites, Lexinums, Suilus, and various other newly identified genera. But in this episode, we'll be taking a look at polypores. Those are mushrooms, widely varying in size, which appear as shells or brackets, often growing out of living or dead wood. As is pretty much always the case with the various fungal species, these fungi come in a wide variety of shapes and colors. But I find one of the most interesting things to take note of about the polypores is that they are actually derived of various genera, which is to say they are genetically unrelated, but have co-evolved similar morphologies, or body types, if you will, due to the practicality of the bracket or shelf shape. Thus, there are many polypores which are genetically entirely unrelated, coming from orders as diverse as Gloophyllales, Trichosporales, Amylocorticiales, Cantharellales, Agaricales, and of course, as they are polypores, Polyporales, not to mention a variety of others. Many of the polypores have hard, woody bodies, but some are suitable for food, such as Latopore speciosus, commonly known as the sulfur shelf, and one of my personal favorites, Cereoporus guamosus, the dryad saddle. A personal favorite, I might add, because it grows around here, while in this neck of the woods I never find sulfur shells. And many of these fungi are known for medicinal purposes. In terms of morphology, one might say the polypores are simpler than the various cap and stem fungi we studied in the previous two episodes. And to illustrate, we'll use the Scanoderma sugae, also known as the varnish shelf, because of its perpetually freshly varnished appearance. The body of polypores has often been described as being shaped like kidneys or beans, though to me the Ganoderma sugae in the image above is more like a fan. And some polypore forms seem to emerge directly out of the wood without a stem or stipe attaching them to the wood, whereas others, as we see at the top of the Ganoderma sugae here, do have a stipe. And the stipe shapes, sizes, and appearances can vary a great deal, which we'll take a look at later. The underside of fresh polypores will present a poor surface. And if one examines the surface under close magnification, the pores from which spores exit can readily be seen. Let's take a look at the inside of this polypore to illustrate. Here, I've cut a smooth cross section across the main body of the Ganoderma sugae, the varnished reishi. Notice above where you see the thin layer of coloration. That's the mushroom's skin. The white interior in the middle is its main body. And beneath, you'll see a collection of vertically oriented tiny tubes. These form the pores from which spores are released. Let's take a closer look at those pore tubes because they are especially important in the identification of a polypore. Here, on the Scanoderma sugae, they are not especially long, but on some other polypores they can be quite long, forming a substantial part of the thickness of the fungus main body. And once again, if we turn the mushroom over to look at the underside, the pore surface, we will see that it looks little different from the undersides of those mushrooms from the Bolitaceae family. The only real difference being, many of the polypores grow out of wood in a kidney or fan shape. And from each one of those tiny holes that you see, spores are dropped. In fact, this single Ganoderma sugae fan is capable of producing millions upon millions of spores. But for field identification purposes, it is the way the pore tubes attach to the main body, the fan, that create a noticeable and identifiable difference. With those fungi of the Bolitaceae family, such as bolites, laxinums, hemilaxinums, and suilus, the pore tubes can readily be peeled away. With polypores, it is quite difficult, if not impossible, to peel away the tubes. Polypores come in a variety of shapes and may grow out of wood or appear to grow from the ground. And if on wood, the shapes may vary depending on what they're growing out of. Again, the Ganoderma sugae lets us handily illustrate. Here we see a new fungal mass growing out of the log about halfway up its curvature. Because of its placement, this Ganoderma will probably assume a kidney or fan shape. Yet at the moment, because it is so young, it has no particular shape, and the especially young bud beside it simply looks like a colorful bulb. When first forming, new polypores often look like little shapeless bulbs emerging from wood. And notice how these Ganoderma sugae, growing as a cluster out of the hemlock log near a dead branch, grow out as if slightly tube-shaped, but very quickly begin to widen into a fan shape. Typically, a polypore that grows out of a log lying on the ground will assume a fan shape if it begins its growth somewhere halfway up, more or less, the curvature of the log, while the polypore near the bottom has a less distinct shape. Often, polypores growing out of the curvature of a log near the bottom will have a somewhat indistinct shape, though occasionally polypores, such as the Ganoderma sugae, 
will assume what has been described as a periscope shape, as in here. You usually see this when such polypores grow out of the top of a log or near it, though I thought this particular periscope shape was interesting because it too was developing out of the curvature halfway up the log. While the Ganodermasuge tends to possess the classic fan shape of the polypores, others form much more robust, convex bodies. And in much of the north woods of North America, one of the most common and notable of such polypores is Fomes fomentarius, sometimes known as the horsehoof fungus or the tinder fungus, which can often be seen on fallen logs as well as standing snags and even upon the dead wood of still living trees. This fungus has been used in sanction times for medicine, as fire starter, and a thin layer of it can even be converted into a leathery substance called amadou which can be used for making things such as gloves and hats. Note also how these polypores emerge directly from the wood. There is no stipe connecting a body to the wood substrate. This is another common growth form of polypores. And as is typically the case with polypores, the underside is porous. Many polypores form tough and woody bodies, at least as tough as the wood they form on and feed upon, and Fomes fomentarius is no exception. It grows over multiple years upon the substrate of the dying tree, and the pore tubes which it forms, while much thicker and more substantial than those we found on the Ganoderma suge, are very tough, solidly attached to the main body of the fungus. In fact, they can barely be peeled away at all. But if we look very carefully at the pore body revealed in this cross-section of a Fomes fungus, we see something else very interesting. Notice how the pore body seemed to have formed in layers. Three distinct layers at the top, near the main body of the polypore, halfway down, and a third and final layer near the bottom. These are the equivalents of the polypore's growth rings, indicating that this perennial polypore has experienced three years or seasons of growth. And the lowest growth layer is the newest. Also note that while the pore tubes themselves are brown, the underbody of these polypores is white, indicating the spores themselves are white. It is not unusual for a polypore, and indeed many other mushrooms, to have tube bodies of a different color from the spores themselves. And I think it is amazing that a single polypore of Fomes fomentarius can produce nearly 900 million spores an hour on a good day. Massive pore reproduction is a very common strategy among fungi. But there is an extremely low chance that any individual spore will survive to actually grow one day and reproduce. In fact, it can very accurately be said that the chance of any individual spore getting much of a chance to grow, even at all, is much smaller than that of winning the lottery. Even if you don't find polypores growing on a tree in the form of brackets or shells, the presence of the mycelia in and on the wood is revealed by the white and brown rot they cause as the fungi go about digesting the old wood. White and brown rot are both present in this snag. The white rot is pale, long, and spaghetti-like. Brown rot is darker and more squared off. White rot is caused by fungi which break down lignin, the material which gives plant cell walls their strength and structure. Many prized edible mushrooms, such as the pleurotus, also known as oyster mushrooms, cause it, though the oyster mushrooms are not polypores. But it is also caused by polypores like Fomes fomentarius, the horse of fungus, Tromatis versicolor, the turkey tail, and various Ganoderma fungi, such as Ganoderma opalinatum, the artist conch. White rot breaks down the lignans, leaving cellulose, which has a whitish or yellowish color, hence the name. And wood that has been subjected to white rot may afterward feel spongy or stringy due to its weakened structure. But the majority of polypores feed on cellulose, which causes brown rot. They produce hydrogen peroxide, along with a number of other chemicals, which break down cellulose, allowing them to extract the nutrients. This action turns the cellulose brown, and it breaks down into distinctive, roughly cubical shapes. It was about 300 million years ago that polypores and their kin, the Basidiomycetes, evolved the ability to efficiently break down lignin and cellulose. Armed with this powerful new nutrient-gathering strategy, they filled a new niche and rapidly spread around the world, consuming dead plants and fungi and returning their nutrients to the ecosystem. And they were so efficient at this that they put an end to the Carboniferous era, that period in time, where old organic matter could not break down very well and tended to gather and accumulate until eventually it was buried, came under pressure, and formed over tens of millions of years into coal. Polypores, as noted earlier, come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, from the diminutive Tremates versicolor, known commonly as the turkey tail, and much more substantial growths, such as we see among the Fomatopsis. By and large, polypores are non-toxic. Some are medicinal and even highly sought after and some are even edible. 
Most, however, will be leathery or woody and entirely indigestible, though even then I find they often have uses such as tinder for fire starter. But in the foraging community there is a myth that there are no poisonous polypores, while it is true that there are exceedingly few poisonous polypores, which, take note, is not the same as saying they're edible or even medicinal, they're just not poisonous. One should be cautious of polypores in the Hapalopilus genus, especially those of the species Nidolans, which is commonly known as the cinnamon bracket. It is an uncommon fungus which grows east of the Rocky Mountains, and to me looks both unappealing and uninteresting, and it has rarely ever drawn the interest of foragers. But over the years there have been a couple poisonings, and it is seriously toxic. It can cause dysregulation of the central nervous system, as well as lead to both liver and kidney dysfunction. Fortunately, it is easily identified, and only one of many, many species of polypores. Hapilopilus nidolans can be 2.5 to 12 centimeters across, and when young can be fairly fleshy, with a flesh up to 3 centimeters thick. While it becomes hard, woody, or brittle when it's dried, when young, that fleshy texture can lead it to be confused with edible polypores, such as the sulfur shelf and the beefsteak fungus. Note that sulfur shells have bright yellow to orange coloration, and beefsteak fungi have a red coloration that not only really looks like a steak, but if cut, they bleed a red juice, somewhat like blood. The top of Hapilopilus nidolans is covered with matted hairs, has shallow, concentric circles, and it is of a dull brown-orange color. These traits alone should make it stand out from the edible fungi, but if one looks underneath, one will see open, spore-bearing structures, quite distinct from many other polypores, and very different from both the undersurfaces of sulfur shells and beefsteak fungi. Remember, when identifying fungi, it is always important to take as much note of what is underneath as what is on top. This video should provide you with the basics for understanding bracket and shell fungi, also known as the polypores. Of course, there is much more to learn. I've been studying mushrooms much of my life, and every time I go out into the woods or meadows to observe them, I find new things that I've never seen before. This should come as no surprise, since it is estimated there are 5 million or more species of mushrooms in the world many of which have never yet even been catalogued or described. The points we've gone over in this video are related to field identification. One can become more precise by bringing mushrooms into the home and making spore prints as described in the first episode of this series, or even investing in a microscope and learning how to measure spores, colors, shapes, and sizes. But no matter how far you take your skills in the world of mushroom observation and identification, prepare to always be surprised. Mushrooms will never cease to amaze you with their striking variety of shapes and colors, their massive or minuscule sizes, and as you get deeper into studying them, their uncanny intelligence and the way these ancient organisms have interwoven so much of the life we find here in the world. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like. Just bad.